Brady, welcome back to This Is Horror. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, it's always it's always nice to be in horror. Yeah, yeah, it has been a while. It's been longer than I thought it had been, because when I checked the calendar, the last time we were speaking with you was around the end of 2018. So oh, yeah, a few things have changed. Yeah, yeah. I wonder though yeah, for no, you. It's, it's been mm, a while. Yeah. Yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. What have been some of the biggest changes for you, both personally and professionally, in that time? Um, let's see, 2018 was we sold our souls, I think. Um mm. <clears throat> which is uh, my heavy metal horror book, which is my favorite of my books. But uh, <clears throat> what I didn't know at the time is it really uh, bombed. And so if I hadn't had another book on contract, that probably would have been the end of my career. But I had a Southern Book Club after that, which was my last book on my contract uh, with Quirk. And um, and that one did really well. And, and you know, that came out in... 2020, I think, because um, Final Girls, I think, was 21, and then mm. How to Sell a Haunted House was 23. So yeah, so um, that came out, and because I mean, because my publisher decided to hold steady to an, um, I think, an April 2020 release date, or maybe a March 2020 release date, um, everyone else moved their books because of the pandemic, and with reduced competition, uh, it hit the New York Times bestseller list, which was great. Um, and so that was sort of a case of, uh, I think, being in the right place at the right time. And vampires have always been linked with pandemics. So I don't know. Maybe there was something there. Um, so that was really nice. And I changed publishers. I went from Quirk to Berkeley, which has been great. And I don't think... I don't think I had an agent in 2018 or any of that stuff. So I think I got those later in the year, maybe 2019, um, because Southern Book Club was unagented. So um, yeah, so a lot changed professionally. Personally, I don't know, man. I feel the same. Um, a little, a little, a little, probably suffering from a little uh, traumatic response to a to that that pandemic. But glad I wrote it out in New York um, yeah. rather than fleeing the city. But uh, yeah, what have y'all been up to? It's been a minute. Oh, what, what have we been up to? I, I was just uh, prepared to give you a load of follow-on questions and then <laughs> you, oh, you, yeah. reversed it, <laughs> you reversed it to us. I mean, go goodness, actually, since um, the end of 2018, oh, that, that's been good and has been bad in my life, as <laughs> is the roller coaster in general. Um, sure. I mean, if if I start... Let's start with the less good because then we can end on a high. So, I mean, the, the okay. worst thing was me separating from my ex and then um, changing the dynamic in which I see my daughter. So I didn't see oh. her for nearly two years. And that was a very oh, wow. difficult time indeed. Um, but I'm you know, delighted to say that I, as of the start of this year, and I'm seeing her again and restoring that relationship. So oh, that's that, great. How old is she? she? She is going to be five in, well, at, at, at the end of next month. So oh, yeah, wow. it, it was a, a, a big change because I was the main parent for the first two years of her life. Um, and then you know, I, I was pretty much not in her life at all for two years, and now I'm back in her life. I, yeah, that was not yeah, a decision that's a lot. that yeah, it, 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 that was not my choice. I always wanted to be in her life, but um, you sure. know, th th things are so much better now and so much brighter than they were e even at the end of last year. So that. That's the kind of worst thing or the most testing thing that has happened in my life. Um, right. Probably relieved to hear that because if I said that's not the worst, it's like what what is he going to go into <laughs> next? But in in terms of you know re really good things, I mean I've put out a couple of books since then. The girl in the video, um, which 
has had some exciting things happen with it, which I can't talk about at the moment, but they're really exciting. And I oh, hopefully that's great. can yeah, congratulations. soon. Yeah. <clears throat> and then me and Bob put out another novel called They're Watching, and we are currently writing a screenplay for it. So maybe oh, something can happen with that. Um, but th there's been like a lot of writing, a lot of podcasting. Um, I, I moved back to Japan. So I think, yeah, when we spoke in 2018, I would have been in the UK, but now I'm back in Japan again. Um, things are exciting. We, we, this year, 500 episodes and 10 years of this is horror podcast. Oh, wow. So yeah, that's intense. lots going on. Yep. Bob, what have you yep. been doing for the last yeah, <laughs> four <well>. years? <laughs> Oh man, it, it's summarized. You know, it's summarized is uh, writing a book with Michael. Um, you know, they're watching, um, working on learning how to write a screenplay, uh, which is oh, yeah. uh, it's it's a different kind of writing. Um, and uh, and I wrote I wrote a novel. Uh, it's out uh, at uh, in submission right now. Um, so really can't talk any more about it. It's a vampire novel. I have another vampire novel. Uh, I have like the the first one's like fun and happy and gory and, and crazy. And this one's the new one that I'm going to be working on is going to be gloomy and depressing. And uh, the two sides so, of the, the vampire coin. Exactly. Exactly. So, and, uh, and then I'm, I'm uh, taking that, uh, the first novel that's out on sub, I'm actually doing a screenplay on it. So oh, cool. um, I'm going to try to do the double barrel, you know, Hey, I've got both things, which what, what, let's make it happen, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, well, yeah, it's funny, you know, uh, Melissa Singer, who is an editor at Tor from, gosh, I think like 86 until a year or so ago. So mm -hmm. she sort of wrote out that horror paperback boom. Uh, she said that, you know, horror comes in cycles, but vampire oh, yeah. books, she's like, those always sell. She's like, you, they just do what they do. She's like, they're, they're an evergreen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, and it, it's like... Even with horror, horror coming back and everything like that, I think things cycle. We went through the zombie period. We went, you know, the, now we're kind of like into, you know, coming off the end of ghost and going into witches and cults and things like that. And it's like, and, but, you know, within the last last year and then within the next two years, really possibly three years, there are like over 50 vampire films that are going to be out. Yeah. And some of them are actually from, you know, basically, I um, mean, we got, we have a tentpole vampire, vampire film about to hit. So Renfield. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, right. You know, and then I think that, uh, you know, coming up maybe later this year, early next year, we have the last voyage of the Demeter coming up. Uh, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. of course, you know, we have all these other little, little things. So yeah, they, they tend to cycle, but we're kind of, we're, we're seeing vampires and, and things like that. And if you can tie it in with cults and witches and stuff like that, oh, fuck, man, it's going to be fun. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, vampires have always had this real um, connection to plagues and pandemics. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's and that's always been a thing, um, whether it was, you know, Anne Rice and AIDS in the 80s or it was sort of like the fear of the the uh, the British fear of uh, drugs and hypodermic drug use in the early 60s, late 50s with Hammer. And then in the 30s, you had this massive fear of venereal disease, which 1931's Bela Lugosi Dracula follows very beat for beat. And before that, it was uh, tuberculosis, you know, in the 19th mm -hmm. century, which was, you know, people who had tuberculosis were actually, some of them were actually uh, disinterred and staked posthumously for fear that they would come back as a vampire. So mm -hmm. it's always been, so I wonder if that vampire boom has anything to do with uh, the recent pandemic. No, oh, I'm, I'm sure it has. I mean, things we we notice these cycles, and we don't never notice them till we're kind of in them. You know, it's like you yeah. can't so you can't predict it. You just kind of kind of roll with it. And yeah. then once you realize it, though, if you're trying to cash in on it, good luck because I mean, you got you have to just like you you got to have everything together. Everything has to be in order. Uh, but with vampires, it's like you can kind of kind of wait because there'll be a glut of stuff. And then it's like, Oh, we don't even want to touch vampire stuff. And then it's like, Oh wait, Hey, this one's pretty good though. This is a little different. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you just gotta, 
play it, but you know, I'm down. I don't never really try to follow trends. I write the stories that I want to write, you know, and that's, I, I write what I want to read. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, listen, like you said, by the time you follow the trend, it's dead. Yeah. Um, although Michael, what are you doing in Japan? Do you teach her? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm teaching in Japan. So I mean, actually like it's just a really good job for me to be able to facilitate writing and podcasting like the main motivation for taking this job was like what is literally i looked at the different teaching options and i was like what is the one with the maximum amount of holiday and free time that is the one that i'm going to take so i mean I've I've lived in Japan a few times now. First time was in 2014. And I just came to Japan initially because I thought I want to try living somewhere completely different with a different culture to, you know, the UK and the West. And so I, mm-hmm. I thought Japan was one that I was curious about. Just went there to kind of check it out for a year and then fell in love <laughs> with the country and I just any time that I was away I had I guess what you could liken to a wanderlust just drawing me back I felt that I had to be there and it was weird and it is weird because I never feel like that for the UK of course there are elements and aspects that right you know I'm fond of but it was almost like I had a kind of sickness in my heart and like I I felt regret not being there. So I mean, this time, you know, I, I'm back in Japan and I mean, I'm so serious about it that I've literally moved over all my kind of financial accounts and my taxes. This is where mm-hmm. I permanently, you know, would like to be. So I, I mean, yeah. I, I have... I've had a few years where I have written and and podcasted full time. The interesting thing, though, doing that was I realized that actually, yeah, you can get pretty lonely. I thought I was okay with my own company until I just jumped into it full time. And then just, I mean, I, I don't need to do a lot of teaching or have a lot of contact with other people but I need I need some right. and and it it was almost like I I guess like I started to to calcify or the it like I became less good at socializing and became more anxious because I'm just not doing it and yeah so I, I think the sweet spot for me is at least teaching you know, one or two days a week. So I've got that socialization, but I've also got, you know, yeah, the yeah. time to concentrate on on the, the writing and the podcasting and the editing and the things that I'm really passionate about, which, which you know, it isn't to say that I don't enjoy teaching. I do, but it's like, I like teaching. I love writing. That's the best way to put it, really. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I actually have had Japan on the mind recently. Mm. I I just did this thing for a criterion about a uh, Kwaidan um, and, you know, talking about, you know, Masaki Kobayashi's movie. Mm. And um, and so it was really, really interesting to sort of like it, it's a movie I'd seen before a couple of times. And it really was this time taking the time to really drill down on it, you know, to have to like talk about it to other people. Um, was really fascinating how many how many layers it is, and also what a huge impact Lafcadio Hearn had on it. Um, and it was really it was really interesting because I think that even though I feel like his influence as a Westerner living in Japan um, took those stories in a slightly different less japanese direction i wonder if it's one of the re- if it's not one of the reasons why the movies are so powerful you know mm yeah yeah and i think there's something to be said for kind of mixing the western and the eastern influences and mm-hmm. i think i think it really yeah. can then create like a a unique kind of melding part and just yeah, I, I think any time where we dip into different cultures and merge them together, you can then create something unique and niche. And I mean, 
that's kind of where the yeah. best writing and the best filmmaking and the best art can be found. Yeah. It's also, I just recently uh, read this great essay by William Carroll that mm. was about sort of J-horror, because I feel like J-horror is something that's kind of, you know, everyone kind of rolls their eyes now, right? It's dead, wet girls with long black hair. And there were so many knockoffs of the ring and all that, that it got very, I, I think people sort of like, oh, that again i mean i what was it uh was it was it um oh god it was uh it was juan versus the ring it was uh what's her name versus yeah. sadako so, so, you know where uh, it got to yeah, that yeah. point um yeah but carol's essay was really interesting because it was looking at the roots of jhar and sort of that this was kind of there was a lot of theory behind it which was that given video and sort of emerging like portable video technology not portable but like it, it was around but like it was so prevalent and it was so you know digital photography was suddenly the thing in the 90s that there was this refreshed urge to make this look real and you mm. needed to shoot in boring settings and the ghosts needed to do normal things and everything had to be had to look like something that could be plausible and the background had to be as anonymous as possible, as suburban as possible. If you were urban, you shouldn't be able to tell the city. You know, it shouldn't be distinctive. It should just be a boring setting where this mm. unusual disruptive sighting happens, which I thought was really interesting because you see that kind of like, I don't know, that that horrification of banal stuff right now with like, skin a rink and yeah. uh you know um what's that back rooms that youtube thing that's you know just this i and, and so i was like you know i was really off j-horror for a while but now i'm kind of like oh i'm back okay going into it knowing that there was this sort of theoretical framework behind it to um make things look real and in today's world if it looks real it looks like a strip mall uh you know it's really an it, i don't know it gives me a kind of a new hunger to reapproach it yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, I mean, of course, when people are kind of rolling their eyes at J-horror and they're thinking about, you know, the, the girl with the long black hair, I mean, yeah, obviously yeah. they're thinking about that because that certainly was in, in kind of the 90s and the noughties the, the most popular of J-horror, I suppose, tropes and oh, yeah. archetypes. But obviously if one is to you know, say that is Jay horror, they're missing out on an awful lot of other films and other kind of yeah. stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, a anything Takashi Miike does is at the very least Jay horror tangential. And I mean, audition mm -hmm. is, you know, I mean, it's definitely japanese horror so i suppose it depends what what are we defining as gay horror if we've got a limited definition anyway then yeah. of course it's gonna well it's yeah. interesting right because you look at some of Mike's films like audition or gozu yes. and mm. those are horror movies i mean they're straight yeah. up horror movies um i'm not sure there's a western parallel i can think of for gozu except maybe like a more coked up david lynch but right then you look at Mike consciously doing J horror, which would mm. be like one missed call, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Which there seem I don't know. I feel like J horror became less Japanese horror films and more a very specific tr yeah. set of tropes linked to like digital technology, like phones yeah. and cameras and video. And I, there's something you know. It's like you look at Pulse, which I think Kiyoshi Kurosawa's Pulse, which I think is a you know, mm. maybe one of the greatest horror movies uh, yeah. made in the last mm. 50 years. Um, and it's all about the internet, you know, early dial-up internet. So there seems to be something with J-horror that's definitely linked to technology. The same way in the West found footage is definitely linked mm. with technology, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, a lot of that stuff taps into urban weird, too. And that's, you know, yeah, that's kind of, you know, the Archive 81 and things mm -hmm. I, I think that you know a lot of that with the technology tie-in we're so technologically in, in, in sync with with each other it's part of society now um you know everyone has a phone everyone has a tablet and so it makes this stuff relatable 
in the nineties, it was kind of like a novelty because it's like, Oh wow. Yeah. You, you actually have a computer. Oh wow. You know? And so now we go back and we see these, mo- these films, you know, and it, it's kind of like, well, these people were really kind of, you know, they felt like they were pioneers, you know, in, in the digital landscape. But at yeah. the same time, we're tapping in urban. What urban weird does is it taps into stuff from the past and ties it into the present with technology and has been an urban setting. So, yeah, I'm going back well, to these films and looking at that going, wow, it's all fucking urban weird, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because, you know, so I, I ran a film festival, an Asian film festival from about 2000 to 2016 or so. Uh, and a lot of stuff changed in that period. And our original purpose was access. It was so hard to see these movies, you know. Um, and what we wound up realizing is by the time I saw the festival still going on, I kind of stepped out around 2016, but we were fighting with Netflix for premieres. We were, and we realized that the issue was no longer access. The issue was curation. There was access to so much with streaming video and that, no, you know, if you've got, it, it's the Netflix thing, right? The click, click, what are we going to watch tonight? Click, click. It's, there's so much content that knowing someone whose taste you understand has recommended X meant something. And I feel like you've seen the found footage genre do that a little bit, like with The Ring in 99, 99, I think. This tape exists. This tape will kill you. Don't look at this tape. By the time you get to, is it, Bob, is it Archive 89, 81? What archive is it? Archive 81. Remember. 81. By the time you get to that, it's like, I have a massive amount of footage that I'm going to look at and edit. And in there, I have to piece together this story. Like, you know what I mean? It wasn't just like one videotape. It's the one. It will kill you. It's now all this video has to be. Mm-hmm wrangled has to be curated uh and that's actually interesting i hadn't thought about that before but i feel like yeah j or sorry uh found footage horror is kind of reflecting that trend you know Mm -hmm. oh there's no doubt but it's weird i mean at the height of radio were there horror movies about radio like in the 30s and 40s and into the early fifties. I'm not aware. I mean, I yeah, know there's I, that weird hmm. one. I think Nancy Reagan was in one that like the voice of God was speaking to people over the radio, but I'm not aware of anything oh, with no. the weird. I mean, I guess there was like, you know, um, what were those inner sanctum and those radio horror shows, mm-hmm. but I don't know how many of the, well, I guess there was sorry, wrong number about early telephone technology, landline telephones. But I guess so, but it seems less prevalent. Oh, yeah. Yeah, to my mind. Anyway, sorry, but, I didn't mean to take us on a giant no, digression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, it's all good. And I mean, you know by now this is what this is horror is about. We will start on one topic and pretty soon we veered off into another one. And that's, you know, the way that I like it. Take us but, back to the... Back to the path, the lit path through the woods. Okay, okay. Well, since since you have directly <laughs> asked me to do so, let's jump in then to your latest novel, How to Sell a Haunted mm. House. And so I understand, actually, that this was a little bit difficult to get right initially because if I've done my research correctly, and sometimes I haven't, you actually had to kind of write four or so books or four versions of it before you yeah. got to, yeah, to the final one. The, the problem is that's not unusual. Um, the longer I do this, the harder I get. You'd think I'd be getting better at it. I have a really hard time landing the plane these days. I'm, I'm writing my novel for next year right now, and I really – need to turn it in in may Mm. and like i am i am at sea man i still don't feel like i have a firm grip on it and with with how to sell a haunted house that was definitely true i felt like i had a firm grip on it and it wasn't and so i took another stab at it and that one i knew was kind of a, a hail mary like let me just throw everything at the wall i pray my editor will accept one of these it didn't happen. 
I did a third version that I was really convinced, okay, I'm a clever guy. This one is the version. And my editor was still like, it's, it's just not working. And, um, and so the fourth one, which was sort of the stripped down bare bones version, that's mm. the version that wound up sort of being the first one in a series of like, you know, edits and things like that, that, that people are reading. But yeah, I was really convinced that these earlier ver two of the three, two out of the three earlier versions were the right book. But I, I've been there before with my best friend's exorcism. I had a version I thought was great. My wife told me it was a dumpster fire. I rewrote, she was right. I rewrote yeah. it and I thought I had a better version. And I got so angry when it didn't work. My editor and I got in a huge fight over it a couple of times. And then I came to a third version that was also the stripped down version that really worked. So, you know, it takes me a while to get out of my own way. Yeah. So I'm wondering with those initial versions, I mean, what, if any, elements were in those versions that have still survived to the final version? I mean, mm. did... Did did we have Pupkin? Nothing. Did, I... <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. The books were virtually the same up until the final third. Uh, right. I mean, there were there were minor adjustments, but they were really the same up until the final third. And sort of like what's behind Pupkin? Mm, what's really right. changed a couple of times? Um, and. Uh, the only thing that came out of those drafts is um, that still is in the book is the puppet mm. monster at the end where the puppets uh, become a monster. Like, yeah, I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but that's the only thing that really stuck. And that came in the third version um, because the first version revolved around a puppet cult. The second version revolved around a bunch of inbred wieners living in upstate South Carolina. And the third version revolved around uh abandoned marionette theme park and uh or an abandoned little roadside attraction theme park with a marionette theater at its center and that was the one where the the puppet golem and i have to say after pitching this around a bunch in la it is a puppet uh g-o-l-e-m not a g-o-l-l-u-m um <laughs> yeah <laughs> i was i was pitching this and we were using the director and i the the phrase puppet golem quite freely and then after the third pitch, we got notes about Gollum, as in my yeah. precious. And we were like, ah, I see the problem here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like these people are imagining these puppets have banded together to form everyone's favorite all digital Andy Circus creation. Yeah. When in fact, no. Yeah, that is a. Uh... The but yeah, so that's there. really the only thing that <laughs> yeah yeah that's the only thing that really came back. Um, but yeah, that was the one thing. Otherwise, it was just like that. I got to the I got to the last third of the book, and if people have read it, they know almost exactly where that happens. And it was just a heavy boom amputation, amputation, amputation. Throw that and throw that limb in the trash. Yeah. Well. I mean, at least at least you had two thirds of it more or less right from the start. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, and the nice thing is I just kept rewriting those first two thirds to get to the last part. So it, it was nice to take the time to polish it up. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, how how dispiriting in the moment. And it just shows as well. And I mean, we've had similar conversations yeah. with Paul Tremblay that it. It kind of doesn't matter how successful you are or how many books you write or what bestseller list that you hit, you know, you can still run into these problems. And I, I feel that realization, I mean, it's simultaneously depressing, but also uplifting because it means if, you know, me as a writer or somebody else listening as a writer runs into these problems, it's like you're not alone. This is part of the path. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, like, I'm not a big Bruce Lee fan, but he does have that very, very famous quote that's it's not how hard you can hit. It's how hard you can get hit and get back yeah. up. I think Rocky also coined that a little yeah. bit or stole that. Um, but and, you know, it's it's kind of like. You have these moments and, you know, it's funny, I look back through my diaries and I'm like, oh, my God, I can't 
believe how upset I was. And it is upsetting. You know, you've worked mm. really hard on something. You've really spent the hours and the time. And someone's just saying, nah. And they're saying, I don't know what to do, but it's not right. And, you know, you really have a choice. You can quit or you can try again. And um, are we allowed to to use profanity on this podcast? Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah. Someone, someone a long time ago said to me, you know, um, you're going to eat a lot of shit in this business mm. and you have to decide what your cutoff point is. Uh, at what point do you say, I don't, I don't want to eat any more shit. And for me, I was like, yeah, I have no cutoff. I have an infinite appetite for shit. Uh, you know, I always say I've never gotten a bad note. Uh, I've gotten crazy notes. Um, I was doing a thing and I guess, it, I don't know, I won't say the show, but it was an mm. anthology show with a lot of big prestige people on it. And in a, in a general meeting that you sort of take in LA where you just meet, Oh, Hey, nice to meet you. Get a water bottle. I had, I dropped this and they were like, Oh, what's that? And I talked about it a little bit and they're like, Oh, we really like that. And, um, and it was something I kind of had in my back pocket that I'd worked on for fun. And so then I had another meeting where they're like, okay, really pitch this to us. And, and basically what it was, was it was a modern version of Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart. And it was about a, um, uh, a sitcom actor who was hugely famous for the role he played on a sitcom as a dad. Um, and, you know, wealthy, famous, everyone knows his face, his catchphrases, as big as Homer Simpson, if Homer Simpson was a real actor. And the sitcoms ended after, you know, a 12-year run or a ridiculous long time. And he wants to be a serious actor. And he sunk everything he has into his one-man Edgar Allan show, Edgar Allan Poe show. And um, the big highlight is him doing the Telltale Heart. And, you know, he's going to open it. And he's done it around. He's going to open it in New York. And um, but what no one knows is on the sitcom, he had a problem because he really liked to drug women and, and sexually assault them. And his stage manager goes down and the replacement stage manager is someone he recognizes as someone he did that to many years ago. And she pretends it's all good. And he's like, is she gaslighting? What's going on here? Um, and uh, they're like, oh, we love it. So I pitch to them. They kick me upstairs to the next producers. I pitch it to them. They're like, okay, we're bringing in the showrunner. We love this. Showrunner comes in. Someone from the network. It was a network platform. They come in. They're like, okay, we love this. We have one note before we go to a green light. And I'm like, what? And they're like, so we never have one note. We always have lots of notes. Can he not be an actor? And can it not be about a play? And I was like, <laughs> oh my God. What? And, and I was like, I was in the meeting. I was like, yes, what a good note that is. I really <laughs> appreciate your insight. I think it'll be better. And they're like, and we need you to pitch it for, there was a brand name on the show. We need you to pitch it for him. Monday. And this was like a Thursday. And I was like, yes, I will do that. I'm really looking forward to this experience. And I was like, what do I do? What do, I do? And then I realized like, oh, you can just move that to a celebrity chef who's a TV chef who wants to open a real life, you know, Michelin starred fancy pants restaurant. And like, you can do the exact same thing. And, you know, it was even better. My wife's a chef like that. And so I was like, oh my God. So it actually got better. Um, and so it was like, but it was like, it was a note that really kicked out the legs. And for like 24 mm. hours, I was wandering in the wilderness, like calling out for mama. I didn't know, you know, I was just like, I bring me water or buzzards are circling, <laughs> but the note wound up being the right note, you know? Um, and then of course the guy who was behind the show was like, he read the like three page pitch document before I actually pitched it in person. He's like, uh, this is exactly the kind of episode I do not want on this show ever. I don't know why you brought this to me. This is ridiculous. And they were like, oh, smell you later, dude. And it was all over after like six weeks of build up, which is fine. That's what happens. But like, but like I did, the point is there, I, I, I just live by this philosophy. There's no bad, there are no bad notes. Like 
you got to get to the note behind that note. You've got to keep digging. And if they don't like mm. it, your goal is to make them like it. So you've got to get on their wavelength. And that will maybe make you better. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's that thing people talk about. It's like limitations can sometimes be your friend. Like, yeah. those are the limitations. So embrace them or quit. You can always quit. Like, there are plenty of jobs that are better and, and more fun and better, you know, often better paying and more stable and more sane and you can have a life and a family. You know what I mean? Like there's yeah. better things to do with your time. Like, so it's up to you really. And and like, that's not like a, it's up to you, but like, it really is up to you. And, and so, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's a little bit off topic, I suppose, from the point that you were making, but goodness, that show that you pitched, I'm so, intrigued like you know I want to see that but I I can also see how you know for certain people or perhaps for the community in general it it might even hit a little bit too close to home and it's like whoa are we really gonna are we gonna put yeah. that out because that <laughs> yeah that is gonna rough well some you know people. it's funny it's funny I think what they saw it as is I was hopping on a trend like, you know, yeah. Me Too was happening at the time and all that stuff. And I was like, I wasn't, and for me, I didn't feel like I was hopping on a trend so much as this was a throwback because this mm. is a, you know, a character not knowing what's real and what's not is a trope in horror going back to the yellow wallpaper, if not before, mm. you know? Um, and so to me, that's what the reference was just in modern trapping. But I get it. They saw it as something, you know, the book I'm working on right now um, was in part, I, it's, a, it's sort of a, uh, it's set in a home for unwed mothers in, in 1970. And I had actually many years ago pitched it as a um, project to someone else. And they acted as if I was trying to jump on a trend, um, which was interesting because that had never crossed my mind. I've always wanted to write about a home for unwed mothers because what I didn't know until later in my life is that uh, two of my relatives were both sent, you know, sent away as the term was uh, when they were teenagers and never talked about it until well past the time they were in their sixties or seventies. Um, and it really is a cultural blind spot. I felt like, and, and hearing about their experiences and, and then reading about other people's experiences, you're like, how, how did we do this for so long and think it was okay, even though it was okay? I mean, a lot of these women couldn't have stayed in their community and had these kids out of wedlock. And But so it was just such a complicated, weird thing um, that I wanted to write about it for years. So for someone to sort of feel like it was trendy, I was very like, I say, sir, I smack you with my glove. <laughs> yeah. How dare yeah. you? Yeah. Do you think, is there any way that this story might see the light of day in some form, you know, whether in a different medium, the, such as a short story? The, yeah, the, the one that the you... The Telltale picked. Heart one? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I I want to. You know, it's funny. I know there's a lot of writers who will pitch something as a screenplay and then, you know, turn it into a book or have a mm. book and turn it into a screenplay. I find them so different to work in. It's really hard to see one as the other. Um, you know, I've I've done and I'm doing the movie adaptation of Horror Store, uh, which is my first mm, horror yeah. novel, which is about a haunted IKEA. And man, that was a rough. I was like, I'd like to have words with this writer who wrote this <laughs> book. They have a yeah. lot of issues. You know, screenplays are so I mean you guys know this they're so completely external if you can't show someone actively doing it it doesn't exist yeah whereas mm -hmm. books are by their nature almost completely internal you're always inside of someone's point of view um and their thoughts and their emotions and their reactions internally make up such a part of the story so I've always had a hard time making that jump from one to the other yeah yeah well, I mean, going back to the current book, or maybe it's going forward, who knows at this point, time is becoming just a concept, but, you know, have you it's ever... It's a flat circle. 
Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever experienced a haunted house? Nah. Um, I, I get scared as hell when it's dark and there's no one else home. Um, mm. But no, I mean, being in a house that was that felt like there was another consciousness there that was disembodied, nah, that's never happened to me. I mean, I feel like, you know, I, I've had the experience of seeing a ghost once or twice. And, you know, I know exactly what it was in retrospect. Um, you know, the physical sort of um, anomalies that led to that experience. But within the moment, I mean, I really felt like I was seeing yeah. a ghost and that was my reaction. I felt, I feel very lucky um, because it is a very, you know, it's a very uh, reality breaking experience. Um, mm. Nora Sidgwick, who is the, one of the first researchers for the Society for Psychical Research in the UK in the 19th century, she did this census of hallucinations where I think she wound up with 17,000 people writing in about their haunting experience. And she kind of narrowed it down to like 370 and narrowed it down to a further 25. But one of the things she said about it was um, she felt like no one had consciously tried to defraud the society because their experiences were all too boring to be fabricated. And with a real haunting, it really is pretty boring i mean you see someone walk across the room you mm. hear someone who's dead say your name you see your dead grandmother stand sitting in a chair like these are not yeah. this is not the conjuring part six you know these are very but the experience of them is very world-breaking it's mm. you know reality what you existed in is reality for 30 35 40 years however long is suddenly broken in a way you've never experienced. So it's a profound experience for the person, this person experiencing it. But I think it's like a dream, right? Yeah. For you, you've been through something describing it to someone else. They're like checking their watch and like, oh, you done yet? I don't know if yeah. you guys lived in a haunted house. Um, you have. I, no, no, I don't, I don't think so. I don't oh. think I've lived in a, in a haunted house. Um, I, I'm not even sure what 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 would that mean. What would that be? I my 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 beliefs in that area are skeptical. I mean, I've I, I I don't know if I said this to you in the previous time that we spoke, but I I've had one very unusual experience. Did I tell you oh, about? Oh, I do remember this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About yeah. the planes, right? Yeah, ex yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that yeah. that is the one experience that I've had, and you know, I've tried to come up with explanations about it. But yeah, apart from that, I haven't had anything that you would say is like supernatural. I mean, it's interesting because pretty much everyone else in my family have had that kind of thing, but I I guess like. They're be I mean, they, they believe in it more than I do. It, it's funny how if we seem to believe in things, we can almost manifest them to become reality. And I mean, right. does that mean they are reality? I mean, it's certainly part of the person experiencing it. It's part of their reality. So I'm not sure. Now we're kind of jumping into a almost philosophical area of what is truth, what is reality, which is oh, for God's some... sake, let's avoid philosophy. Yeah, uh, Bob, what about you? Have the you lived in a haunted house? <laughs> no, uh, I'm 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 a skeptic as well. Um, I've had you know I've had things that have happened to me that <clears throat> at the time you know scared the shit out of me. Uh, but, you know, and like you were talking about, Grady, in retrospect, and, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, oh, that's what that was. Um, I'm yeah. nearsighted. So, um, and without contact lenses or glasses, my my vision is very bad. And so uh, I do suffer from uh, pareidolia uh, anyway. And, uh, but, and, and it's not really a suffer thing. It's just, you know, I have a, a propensity to make faces out of shapes that aren't faces. Oh, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, but when you combine that with not having proper vision or having corrective lenses in there, you know, you could wake up and realize that that, you know, pillow is not a severed head that's in your bed with you. It's actually just your blanket and your pillow that just made that face. 
you right. know, but you're still going to try to reach out and touch it and to make sure that you don't get any blood on your fingers. Uh, um, yeah. You know, well, you and, get that experience in the moment of, Oh, it's scared the shit is, out of you. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I do have, um, and probably since I'm mentioning it, I'll probably have an, an episode of it, but I do have night terrors, uh, oh, with the, with too. the sleep paralysis. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, and so I didn't, and of course I'm, of course the new project I'm working on deals with that. So I've got a lot of, usually they get triggered by mentioning it or thinking about it. So, yeah, but I use it as research. Yeah. 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 It's funny. No, I get those, I get that sleep paralysis too. And it's, it's really awful. Like it's really in the moment. It's really terrifying mm -hmm. um, to feel like you're just sort of flailing away and something's there and you can't stop the experience or make it go away and mm -hmm. really really awful yeah and for me it's like the worst part about it is is i can't open my eyes that's the whole thing it's mm. like you get to like this half vision and i think that's where people would would say that they see like the shadow people and stuff like that because anything that moves looks like you know it's obviously gonna be a shadow because yeah. your eyes are half open and uh that's to me it's like the hardest part is just trying to pull out of it it's just like oh yeah. man you know and once no, you it get out like of it, it's tight. physical effort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting. Of uh, I just read this article in the Columbia Historical Review, uh, but it was about the belief that, or the theory that a lot of witch hysteria might have been informed by uh, sleep paralysis and sleep uh, disorders. Mm -hmm. um that you know that some of the testimony of people who felt like they'd been visited by a spirit in the night or a black dog or or whatever satan really um jived with some subjective experiences of people suffering from sleep paralysis and the writer really looked into sort of like you know uh 16th and, and 17th century sleep were so different. Like people had two sleeps in the night and their sleep hygiene was garbage. Um, so they spent a lot of time in that sort of like space, that half waking space. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this idea that you're supposed to get eight hours of sleep, you know, a lot of people, monks, especially and nuns, they got four hours of sleep, maybe five every night. And so it was, it was really interesting. There's, you know, you can't do a lot of it because it's so far in the past and the historical record you've got is the one you've got. Um, but it was a really interesting take on it. And, and I would, I really feel like, you know, if I had no context for sleep paralysis, I would be having a podcast with you guys saying, Oh, every now and then I totally get visited by an evil spirit at night, mm -hmm. like every six to eight months. And it's really terrible. I, I dislike it immensely. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And I and I'm looking for a witch to to, to murder, yeah, to make it go away, <laughs> right? Yeah. Do Do you find like kind of the less sleep that you've had, that the more likely it is for you to have some sort of sleep paralysis episode? Is there a connection it there? So randomly, you know, it's so random. Um, it I think it more has to do with stress. Um, yeah. I, I'm a big zombie guy. Like, that's my genre. Like, you know, I think everyone has a genre that they fix on to early. That's the that's your go to comfort genre. And so mine, mm. you know, um, Stephen Graham Jones, his is slashers, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. mine is zombies. Um, and so when I'm super stressed out, I have a zombie dream and it usually picks up from the ending of the previous one. And sometimes it's really incredible because it'll be years between them and it'll cleanly pick up. I'll have forgotten about it and I'll have the dream. Oh, Oh, we're back there. And it'll just cleanly pick up right from the end. Um, and it's a way I know that I'm stressed out. Even, even if I don't feel so I'm like, Hey, I'm great. And then I go to sleep and have this terrifying, I mean, they really are a sweaty, awful nightmare. Mm. Um, and I'm like, Oh, I'm more stressed out than I must think. Cause I'm having that zombie dream again. Yeah. Do you think in the future you would like to, tackle like a kind of zombie book and i mean i imagine if the, you... oh, you're in a you're in a sore spot now um okay. i would <laughs> love i you know i avoided it because i was like i love zombie stuff too much i would just fanboy too much over it like you know it would be terrible and then i was talking to someone 
and they mention this brief nugget of an idea. Mm. And I took it and I ran with it. And I was like, oh my God, that's the zombie book I want to write. But because that nugget of an idea came up in a professional context, I can't, I can't use their idea. You know what I mean? It's even though what I extrapolated it out to is way divorced, I would never be comfortable with that. Um, and so, God, I want to do it so badly. And I just, I've talked to them and, you know, I just like, there's, there's no way to make it work comfortably. So I just, I gotta, I gotta live. If this person dies in a terrible accident and their company headquarters, like their offices burn in a mysterious fire. So any record of our conversation is gone. If I write a zombie novel, everyone will know that there has been some, some suspicious deaths and, and arson somewhere in Southern California. I mean, let's calm down for a second, because there is the possibility that you might come up with another <laughs> zombie idea. We don't need to have That's any true. That's true. I don't think so. This one was good. Oh, yeah. This one was so good. It's like, it's funny. Like, I've got a Bigfoot book I want to write that I will write eventually. And every now and then someone will write a Bigfoot book. And I'm like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Is it going to be my Bigfoot book? And then it's totally different. I'm like, yeah, of course. Mine's yeah. better. So I got I to gotta <laughs> really... It's going to take me a while to get there. I got three books before it, but I want to get to that Bigfoot book badly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, one of the most exciting things about, you know, when reading a Grady Hendrix book and the same with a Stephen Graham Jones is often both of you will will take a trope or a subgenre or something that, you know, on the surface has been done to death and then you will completely invert it. It's like, right, how are we going to make a completely different haunted house yeah. book or how are we going to make a different slasher book? And so, I mean, that, that's one reason I'd be so intrigued to see what your zombie concept is, because I know, I know that it won't be like any other. And I mean, probably the, the well, person I mean, will but, die you know, of natural the, causes eventually. So just hang on in there. Well, it's interesting. You know, it's, it's a, God, I think he's younger than me. Um, but <laughs> oh, no. it's interesting. Like, you know, there's only so many things, right? There's only so many monsters. There's only, but it's sort of trying to figure out what made them scary in the first place. What made mm. them upsetting? Where the fun is for me. Um, and that's, that's what I'm really struggling with the book I'm writing right now, because I'm not sure I figured that out yet, but I feel like at this point I've got to do a, I've done a first draft. I've got to get a revision done, mm. even if it's terrible. Cause I got to give it to another set of eyes to be like, dude, point me point, which direction do you think I should start walking to get out of these woods? Like mm-hmm. which way is the open land? Um, because I'm just like lost in this. And I feel like uh, I've lost what, what, what was the original impulse here? So, and it took me a while. I always like to have a title early on um, because I find a title and it's like kind of like my compass uh, mm. that I used to steer by. And I just figured out the title like oh, two weeks ago. And I've been working on this book for 10 months, eight months. So it's yeah. like, it's, it's really slowly coming together. Like I said, I wish I was getting better at this. I seem to be getting worse. The final yeah. product may be fine, but like the process to get there is, is, is more painful every time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel that. And I think as well with experience, sometimes we can, you know, become more aware of errors and more aware of, you know, what what is kind of steering off track. And I, I have a tendency, yeah. an annoying tendency to, in my brain, want to compare my first draft with the final draft of another project. And then I'm annoyed because it's like, mm. well, this isn't as good. And it's like, well... Of course it isn't as good. This is the first draft. You know, yeah. you haven't properly like I, I need to have that first draft and even really the second draft to Absolutely. even see the proper shape and to be able to mold it into something. Yeah. Hundred percent. And you know, and it's funny, um it's interesting because you also want to challenge yourself 
yeah. with each thing you write. You want to do something new. You want to push yourself. And that's not always comfortable. Uh, mm. And, you know, it's it's interesting. I look at some writers who I feel like, and, and I mean, I'm talking about people like I grew up reading, um, like Clive Cussler. He was very comfortable delivering virtually the same book with minor changes every time. And I loved them. There was a period of my life where I like, I was just consuming, inhaling Clive Cussler. And then you look at someone like Stephen King, who I feel like really tries to do something different every time. You know, I don't think Stephen King could have written Revival or Duma Key or um, the Kennedy assassination book, whose title 22, whatever, 64 uh, or 63. I can't remember. Um, I don't think he could have written those in the first decade of his career. Um, especially Revival, which I actually, I know some people are mixed on, but I love, but that's an old man's book. I mean, that's a book written by someone who's watched a lot of friends die um, and is worried about their own death in, in, in interesting ways. Um, so I feel like you always want to push yourself, but the pushing doesn't feel good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, I know we're coming up to the time that we have together today, but I mean, it's yeah, yeah. a shame. Let's, let's it, give it, it five more minutes. Let's, let's, it, let's, yeah. let's do lightning round or like, yeah, cut, let's cut, let's get to the marrow here. Well, <laughs> and I'll get I shorter. Mean, I, I like the monologue. I don't know if we do, if either of us do the kind of flash round as it were, but um, let, let's talk a little bit about puppets. I mean, what was your first experience with puppets? What was your first interaction? And then how did that develop? Oh, yeah. So I think everyone, you know, we all say, oh, puppets are scary. Dolls are scary, but we grew up with them. I mean, surrounded mm. by them. I mean, I had like, you know, a marionette we bought on the street on some trip we did when I was six, hanging on the back of my door most of my teenage years, you know, um, you get puppets to play with within your kid, like Muppets, you're watching Muppets from the time in Sesame Street, puppets are everywhere. And, you know, dolls and your grandmom has dolls and she collects dolls and you, your parents have some dolls they got on trips. I mean, they're just everywhere. So it's almost like everyone says, ooh, ick. But then you're like, oh, wait, what's that over there? What's that over there? What's that over there? You know, it's funny when people have done the ooh, ick thing with talking about how scary dolls are. When I've been talking to them about this book, I'm like, how many Funkos do you have? Do you have a baby Yoda doll? Does your dog have little doll toys? Do you have kids? Do they have dolls? Like you're surrounded by dolls. Um, the first experience that I think really ties in the book is I was actually in a radical puppet collective for a few, for a little bit, a few months. It wasn't like maybe a year max when I was in university. Um, and and the the stuff about the radical puppet collective in the book very closely mirrors that except for like the massive self-destructive tendencies and the arson and the home invasions but beyond yeah. that it's very close to it um and it was great i loved it man making and wearing those big giant puppets that sort of fit your whole body or take your whole mm -hmm. body to manipulate mm -hmm. it's it erases it's the closest thing you'll ever experience to possession it completely erases you and the puppet wears you and tells you how it wants to move and how it wants to interact and the choices it wants to make. It's a blast. So that was really the first thing. And that was, you know, that was the early 90s when I was like probably 20, 19 or 20. Yeah. When I was doing that stuff. And that's the first thing that really informed is right there in the book. Yeah. Do, do you think that, you know, a puppet can make us braver. It can make us say things that we wouldn't dare oh, yeah. say without. Yeah. A hundred percent. And actually it's funny when I was doing book tour, someone was telling me that their best friend dated a really hardcore puppeteer and they were like, mm. and, and they, they didn't last, but they were like, they use that puppet. Like they had a puppet they used a lot for their shows and they're like, and they would use that puppet to say stuff that they would never say to me without the puppet. Yeah. But like, like mean stuff about our relationship, like really raw stuff. 
Like, yeah, no, 100%. It's not you, it's the puppet. I mean, that's possession states. That's uh, yeah. classical Haitian voodoo, right? Getting possessed, getting ridden by the Loa. You know, you're, you're not you. You are now the embodiment of this god on earth. Yeah. Or puppet. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, w- w- would you say then that, like, do you, do you have a fondness for puppets? Is there any trepidation? Is there any fear? Oh, yeah. it, so- it sounds like you have a complicated yeah. relationship with puppets. A little bit complicated, but also, no, I love them. I'm a big theater guy. And so puppets yeah. are like so great theatrically. So, no, I, puppets don't, they don't particularly scare me. Like, I get why they're scary. Mm. And, you know, and, and a lot of that book was about if we just take the safety off this, it could get intense in an unpleasant way. Um, but no, I, I'm not, I mean, you know, I'm not scared of Ikea. I'm not scared of heavy metal. But there are scary aspects to those things if you just tweak the, dial, the dials right. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And I mean, so, something that I believe you were if not scared of, then um, cautious about. And one of the inspirations for Pupkin was a, uh, I believe, a soft toy that your wife has had since she was oh, yeah. two years old. So oh, yeah. let's hear about that. Yes, yeah, Snokio. Snokio is very much Pupkin. Uh, my wife, he's one of those, you know, we all get those stuffed animals, those comfort objects, those blankies, those lammies, mm. whatever they are. They pop up when you're two, three, one, and you stick with them for a long time. And Snokio is my wife's. No one's quite sure where he came from. He just sort of appeared when she was about two. And um, he's a stuffed dude. He's not a, not a puppet. Uh, so I took some liberties. But the first time I met Snokio, he was, he's terrifying, frankly. And you're looking at this guy who's like really looks like a deranged clown who's going to slit your throat in your sleep. And he's being held by someone you love who clearly loves him. And you're like, have I just entered a really bad Texas chainsaw situation (laughs) where like, I didn't know how crazy the crazy went and now it's too late and I am surrounded and outnumbered. Um, But I've grown to really love the dude. He's still with us. And like, he's a, he's a really good guy. He has a completely different perspective on the world. Uh, but he very much is was the the basis for Pupkin, uh, and he's enjoying his fifteen minutes. Yeah, w- where is Snokio now? I Which mean, is good because I don't want him to get upset. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, right in the other room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's here. He he hangs out. I mean, because the other thing is, you know, I've always had a problem with those Toy Story movies because I mm. feel like they lit that Andy kid off too easy. It's like. Here are your toys. Here are these things that watched out for you as a kid. They provided you comfort. They provided you all mm. this stuff. And now you're just going to, what? They go in a box? They go in the garbage? They go in the attic? What, what what happens next? And the toys are always like, oh, whatever. We're good. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I feel like that obligation is a two-way street. So, yeah. Snokio is, Snokio is never going in the garbage. He's going to hang out this forever. Like giving him to another kid seems really like, like, I don't know, unsavory, like just weird. Also, any other kid would probably like lose their minds the second they looked into his eyes. Um, right. He built up a resistance. So yeah, he's <laughs> with us forever. And I assume one of us will die before the other and he'll, he'll wind up in one of our coffins. Yeah. Yeah. Now maybe you Unless know you or, yeah right right maybe, maybe you or Stephen Graham Jones can redeem Toy Story maybe you can write like I don't know Toy Story Seven the Revenge and it, oh boy it's taken a very kind of exactly horrific turn <laughs> yeah we're back Andy you yeah. thought you got rid of us yeah ah oh. we we're I, back I, from that circus. Yeah, we've learned some I, new tricks. Yeah, I I would love to see Toy Story go full horror, but you know the the only reluctance is just like you know if children accidentally see it because they're intrigued. I feel just for not traumatizing generations of really young children. I mean, I I've got soft since becoming a dad. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah, ch- kids are traumatized by the time they're five by one thing or the other. Like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. 
<laughs> okay. If it's not this, it's that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We, we're going to traumatize them anyway. Well, we are out of time, but I mean, we, yeah, we, we've spoken a little bit about how to sell a haunted house. We've given some people some ideas of the themes could you just give us, for those kind of still on the edge, what is your kind of one-minute pitch of how to sell oh, a sure. haunted house? Yeah. No, it's my new book. It just came out in January of this year, so only like three months ago. Um, and it's about uh, a pair of adult siblings who hate each other, a brother and a sister, can't stand each other. And they have to sort of work together when their parents die in a car accident and they need to clean out their childhood home and put it on the market. And the home is, of course, haunted right there in the title. Uh, but it's haunted by puppets and dolls, uh, which is inexcusable on my part. Um, and and that's the book. I mean, that is 100%. That's all you need to know. At that point, you're like, nope and out of there because of puppets and dolls. Or you're like, I'm all in. Hopefully not because of puppets and dolls. All right. Well, where can our listeners connect with you? Uh, the easiest way to find me or avoid me is gradyhendrix.com. Go there for more of me or stay away from there if you don't want to hear <laughs> my voice again. Yeah. Do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? No, no. I, I feel like we've uh, really dived in uh and swum these waters i would just say you know um if people are worried about puppets don't be they're amazing uh and i highly encourage people who haven't done any puppetry to do it because it really is it might take a little while to get there but man it is a out-of-body experience mm -hmm.